I had some requests from a few people to uh, update on how our nuke mating yard did. That would be the yard we put together in that video we did about a month ago on splitting. Uh, we did fair. I've done better and I've done worse. We got an 87% take here. The nuke boxes on the back of the truck represent the duds. Those were ones that were queenless or a laying worker. We put this yard together about four and a half weeks ago and a few of them had already turned laying worker if they didn't have a laying queen. Um, usually we like to get back within three to three and a half weeks to check on nukes to uh, avoid that, but we just couldn't do it this time. We've been getting uh, some work done on some colonies that we're selling and we just finally got it done so we were able to get in and check all our nukes. We just got our other two breeder queens from Sue Kobe, so we're going to get those established today and hope to be grafting from them within 10 days. So we'll come back into this yard and harvest all these queens and use these as queen mating nukes again. That process is running about two weeks late for us too. I'd hoped to already have harvested these queens and got in, gotten in another group of cells, but that's a beekeeper's life. Sometimes you're just running behind. You got to do what you got to do. So 87% is not terrible. And, well, actually, it's pretty decent, but uh, I always hope for a little more, of course. I'm happy. Another reason we like to harvest queens between three and four weeks is because we have a much better acceptance rate when we're introducing them. We also have a much lower rate of supersedure. Um, actually, it's much lower. We also try to avoid banking queens for more than a few days if we can help it for the same reasons. I know a lot of the large queen producers out there harvest queens on a 14-day cycle, or in other words, they catch queens from their mating nukes every 14 days, and then they introduce another cell that will be harvested 14 days later. Queens harvested like that have barely begun to lay, and that's only if the weather for mating was good and they got mated on time. In my opinion, producers harvesting queens on a two-week cycle are really doing their customers a great disservice. All right, let's check out and see what one of these nukes looks like. Okay, so they've been here four and a half weeks. And that's exactly what we would expect to see from one of our queens in four and a half weeks from the date we put the cell in. You can see her pattern is real good. In the center, she already has a few hatching bees, so uh, this is definitely one of our cells that hatched and made it and did well. well let's see if we can find her and see what one of these Caucasian queens looks like. Okay, you can see she's got 
can see she's got some hatching bees on this frame too. So uh, she's been laying eggs for a little while. And, and there she is right there. Let me lay this down and get a hold of her. Okay, so that's one of the daughters of those expensive breeder queens we were talking about. Caucasian queen. Actually, this queen is 75% Caucasian. That's exactly what she is. And her little blue dot. So we'll find her easy next time. Okay. Okay, Jesse has found a queen here that is not from one of our cells. It's obviously Italian. The brood hasn't progressed that far, so we know that she's uh, a queen that this colony raised themselves. And we're, I'm just kill her, Jesse. I don't want her. We're not trying to introduce more Italian blood into our outfit. We're trying to make it Caucasian. We'll so just we'll disassemble that nuke and uh, do away with it. As you can see here, we don't pay much attention to creating nice, perfect, beautiful lines with our queen mating nukes. A little bit of a change up in angle. Uh, several feet apart. I think that gives you better mating than have everything perfectly in a row. Okay, here's another one of our queen mating groups. This one was established in late June, I think. It's been through a couple rounds of queens and we're here to check the latest one. Big long row of nukes up through there. I think currently we've got, we'll see, one, two, three, four, five different groups of queen mating nukes going. We'll see how this one did. Okay, Seth, this is a good learning moment. You see how this comb is smashed up against this wall? You can see the comb is real tight, and that's a place where the beetles can get started. You need to be able to space that from the wall so the bees can police that space. If they can't police the area between the comb and the wall, that's where the beetles can get started. So squeeze your frames to the center and make sure the bees can police both walls and have a lot less beetle problems there. So John's just putting one hole in these lids. It's just a two penny nail, one hole. We're not trying to draw a foundation. We're just trying to keep them from starving. They're just queen mating nukes. This is a five pound honey jar, a little less than half a gallon. One to one syrup. That'll hold them for a few weeks. Well, that'll hold them for a couple weeks anyway. Yard wasn't as good as the first yard. I haven't done the math. I'm thinking we got about 75% here. Might be a little better. It's getting late in the season too. We don't have the drone population that we had to even just a month ago. That might be a factor in all of this. Anyway, we've got two more groups to check before we're all done checking nukes. I only had about a 60 or 65% take in this yard. I know the reason why. I knew of the problem before I dropped them off here, but I really didn't have a choice. It was kind of a um, situation of convenience that day we had to put them here. Over the years, I've always noticed a lower success rate when I put mating nukes close to established colonies. It's just my casual observation. I can't point to any research or studies to back me up. Uh, maybe there's too much confusion for the virgins coming in, or maybe it's just a matter of the virgins being intimidated by all the bee traffic. I really don't know. Shouldn't try to explain it because I, I just don't know the answer. All I do know for sure is that it does make a difference. The other day I was talking to Chris Werner, who produces a whole lot more queens than I do, and he keeps better notes than I do too. He said his long-term average, including good years and bad years, good yards and bad yards, is between 77 and 80 percent. He said he can have trouble in yards that have high dragonfly populations. Uh, I've heard that. 
Um, dragonflies can easily catch a virgin queen on their mating flight, and you can see a lot of them around bodies of water, swamps, and things like that. Just like me, Chris says he has a high percentage take in some yards, and maybe in the 90s, mid-90s, and occasionally even high 90s. We all like to see that. Then there's times like this when it's only in the 60s, and sometimes there's even no apparent reason. You just don't know why. I once asked a friend of mine who's the one of the largest queen producers in South Georgia why he puts queens in packages in early to mid-March when he knew they weren't that great, and he said because the customers demand it. I didn't say this to him, but I couldn't do that, and it just goes to show you that the customer isn't always right. I know some people will argue with me, but that's too early for South Georgia. Some years you will be fine, but some you will not. The mating temperatures are iffy at that time of year and the drones are still a bit young. You're kind of rolling the dice in my opinion. It takes at least till late March and some years it even takes till the first of April to get the very best queens out of South Georgia. That's a mistake a lot of people make. They push it too early and then they wonder why they have high supersedure numbers. Poor mating will do that and the best to, it's just best to wait an extra week or two and do it right the first time in my opinion. Steve Tabor once told me that poor queens aren't always about the stock, but sometimes it's just simply about the producer cutting corners. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. Okay, first off, we're at a wood mill, so forgive all the racket in the background, but we ran across something that's a little educational. Seth found a double deep colony with an excluder and at first he thought there was two queens, one in the top and one in the bottom. This excluder is barely bent right here, and I mean barely. But that's all it takes for a queen to squeeze through and go back and forth. So that's why I'm very adamant with my employees not to throw these metal wire excluders around. It just takes a little small bend like that to let a queen through. Anyway, we don't have two queens. We've actually got one. She's just been going back and forth apparently and I think that's why right there. Thanks. Okay, it's been one month since we pulled the nukes out of this yard. So I, I believe this is one of the colonies we worked in that uh, How to Split Your Bees video. It's taken two buckets of real thin syrup. Uh, we were putting 1,000 pounds of sugar in a tote. A tote holds uh, 250 to 275 gallons, so that's pretty thin syrup. I just want to have a look at what they've done with that. There has not been any honey flow, it's been a dearth, so all the foundation drawn in this colony has been on straight sugar syrup. They're just starting to work on the last frame. Frame's about two thirds done. That's uh, pretty close to being done. Something I like to do uh, when the bees are drying, if they haven't done a front corner, I'll reverse the frame like that and put that corner that's not finished towards the back of the box. That encourages them to get it finished. A little bit of brood on that one, so they expanded their brood nest a little bit. Yeah, this side's even better. So they've come along on that uh, four gallons of syrup. That would have been the four frames we left there, right there. So the four frames that we were leaving behind are right here. They've got brood all the way out on that. And they've drawn that out pretty good. I'm gonna reverse it like I was talking about, get that on finished corner back in the back. Anyway, so that's what you can do with sugar syrup. Um, the whole yard has been handled this way. They've all grown. They've all done nicely. Um, we're going to fill this bucket today. 
That'll be their third bucket of that real thin sugar syrup. Some of these behind me still have a little farther to go, so they might get another bucket before the season is over. It's, uh, let's see, it's the 4th of September. So they'll draw foundation for another couple weeks. By the time we get into late September, they won't draw foundation no matter what you do. So anything we want to get accomplished has to be done in the next two or three weeks. And then it's really just shutting it down for winter. They'll be ready though. I'm happy with what I'm seeing here. It's good. Okay, John's looking at this one. This is the, we saw this is a red flag. Open the lid and you don't see a lot of bees. First thing we wonder is why. What's the reason? Is it the queen? Is it queen less? Uh, we just don't know. So this is one of those callings we really need to take a closer look at and see what's going on. John, let's go right to the center mm -hmm. of the brood. Let's see if there is brood. Let's see what's happening. Okay. Yeah. So the next question is, why are they small? There could be several reasons. One thing we might look at is to see if there's any hatched queen cells in there. Maybe they superseded or swarmed or you know, I, I don't know. But uh, John, let's look at another frame and make sure that that queen's doing a good job on more than one frame. Okay, is that full of eggs and larvae? Uh, yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, they look healthy. I don't see a problem. It's just a sm what's what's on this one right here? Yeah. I the pattern doesn't look bad, John, but uh, I think that's one of those queens we need to replace. That's really not good enough.